My name is Jeff Cage. Uh, I'm an artist living in Lowell. This is my studio. So, uh, you know, when I was uh, divorced and my kids were grown and they've all gone to New York uh, and uh, had a big house and I was rattling around in it, I thought, well, the best thing to do would be to find my city life again. I don't know. I've always been an artist. Uh, I, I, that's all I ever wanted to do. You know, I mean, when I, when I got it, first of all, my mother was the primary influence. She loved piano. She loved, uh, she wanted me to play piano most of all, but uh, I was not musically inclined. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, when I went to the university, I knew that I was never going to do anything practical. I, I was in theater because, you know, I was interested in media and that sort of thing. My first degree was in theater. Uh, but I found that I was coming late to rehearsals because I wanted to spend time in the studio with the sculpture. It's interesting that my work now is uh, I'm sort of migrating back towards my professor's influence who, who loved natural, natural objects. Uh, he liked seed pods and, and all that sort of thing. And my recent work has been moving uh, in the direction of uh, botany and biology and, and, and this kind of universal, you know, all one thing. Certain plant forms that, that just grabbed me, as you can see behind me, uh, you know, when I was in Paris, <laughs> I went to the botanical gardens and uh, I saw these uh, uh, amorphophallus plants, is what they're called. And uh, so, you know, I said, oh, wow, you know, amorphophallus, it has all of the right words in it, amor and phallus. Uh, and so uh, I thought, this is a fascinating plant. It turns out it's a unisexual plant. Uh, and uh, meaning that uh, it, uh, this, this is the leaf that actually protects uh, the spadix, it's called, and the spadix uh, is only the support for the, the sexual organs. So, I mean, my whole, one of my whole themes is, uh, uh, in this case, uh, that the flower is the sexual organ of a plant. Uh, and um, so in this unisexual plant, it has both male and female, they're actually I'm going to make one where I actually have them. They're little florets uh, that, that, that grow on the side of this. Uh, and then uh, once a year for about 40 days, it got, gives off a fetid smell. I mean, a really awful smell. People describe it. I've never smelled it, but it smells like uh, uh, decaying garbage. Uh, and uh, this creates desire, <laughs> not people. For people, it's repugnant and they want to go in the other direction, but desire on the part of bugs and you know, who then, of course, crawl all over and pollinate. But all they have to do is go from one neighborhood on the spadix to the other, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it reproduces itself. What I love about paper mache is that it is simple, it is economical, and it's everything that I need, and it's natural. And I can do all, I buy all of my art supplies in the grocery store. Work is uh, done with uh, just a mixture of flour and water. The window screen I cut more or less randomly into the general shape of uh, a morphophallus leaf. Step number two, leaf goes on stem. no system. You just kind of uh, twist and push and wind and uh, rewind until it takes a shape that I like. So we do strips. The interesting thing is is that newspaper is the absolutely, absolutely precise, exact right degree of absorption and flexibility for paper mache. I've experimented with paper towels, with toilet tissue, with everything. Nothing does it like newspaper. And not just any old newspaper. The Lowell Sun, for example, just doesn't work. New York Times is great.
there is no me, really. There's only me in this present moment. And yet, you know, there's this um, um, organism that made these things, that made this thing in, in the 1990s. He's somehow related to me, uh, but also related to this. So the, 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 the idea of existence being the past and the present existing together, the only difference is the same for everyone, but the only difference for an artist is, is that he makes things that are representative of where he was at, where his mind was at a particular period of time. I have um, partnered with uh, a, uh, a performance artist, uh, Greg Kowalski, who does uh, mainly uh, techno type uh, performance stuff. I, I, I did a performance piece, uh, you know, I'm, since I'm getting older, you know, and, and to die, of course, it's the last chapter. Uh, you know, death uh, is something you can prepare yourself for. You know, I'm trying to mentally prepare myself. I'm, I'm just like everybody else, you know, I think I'm going to live forever. Uh, you know, and I just still feel like a kid at 77 and all that, but I know I'm not, and I know, you know, I got to get rid of that idea, and <laughs> I got to take a few steps so when it actually happens, I'm, I'm prepared. The video is called The Preparation, you know, it, it is almost a ritualized performance of my own uh, passing. Uh, and uh, so anyway, I met a fellow here in, in, in Lowell um, who, he's, he's a young guy, he's in probably maybe 30s, 40s something, I'm not sure exactly how old he is, but uh, uh, he was taken for some reason uh, by uh, the artist Ruol, uh, who was uh, an artist around the uh, first decade of the 20th century, uh, was a member of a group called the Foves or the Wild Beasts, and they were experimenting with expressionism and all that sort of thing, but uh, his expressionism was very spiritual. He was a very deeply devout Catholic and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, but um, uh, there was a time in his life when he was older, I think it was maybe in the late 50s, I'm not exactly sure when, uh, when uh, he had just, uh, in a, through a lawsuit, he had been able to regain all of his work that was owned by uh, by a, a, a dealer, uh, and uh, there were a lot of works that were unfinished. Uh, so he decided that there were about 300 paintings he had to burn because he didn't have enough time left in his life to finish them. So he actually had a sense, you know, he knew how slowly he worked, so he knew these works would, uh, would, would never get finished, so he, he would burn them. So, uh, and interestingly enough, he had a film made of this. Uh, it was in a furnace, and there was a couple of guys, and it's, it's very mysterious. The film only lasts an, a, a minute. Uh, but these, these guys would hand him paintings, they'd get a close-up, you'd see there was one of his famous sad clowns and all that sort of thing, so you knew it was one of his own works, but not finished, and then you'd see him throw it into the furnace. Uh, and so he was captivated by this, so he's done this whole performance piece with ashes and scrolls, you know, about the passage of time and all that sort of thing that, that I manipulate in this thing. He needed somebody to perform in this thing. And, and, and so the, the meeting with me was fortuitous. And I didn't even realize it at the time, but I, I'm 77 years old. And Ruol was exactly 77 years old at the time that he burned these paintings. So um, 
And, and I did tell Greg, I said, you know, sometime I'm going to take this whole amorphophallus garden. I've got to find a place and I'm just going to burn it. And, uh, and maybe I'll burn all of these, uh, all of these phalluses and the whole bit. Uh, because the one thing that I have not learned from all of my training in Zen <laughs> is non-attachment. I cling to my work. I can't sell it. I can't give it away. Once in a while I have to destroy it. But, um, uh, you know, that would be my final act of non-attachment. You know, just, just burn it. So, so he said, you know, oh, wow, you know, so it fits right into my theme. So he said, you, you, you can be my performer. All right, so I start my day with meditation and yoga. It's an example of my practice. Uh, and so I, I've done a, a series of self-portraits, um, you know, of myself practicing yoga. And, and it's, uh, uh, I've been practicing yoga for probably, I don't know, at least 40, 45 years. I love my gong, uh, it's imported from India. And uh, my session begins with three, precisely, strikes of the gong. You know, I mean, yoga, we always think of it as, as the physical exercise, but the yoga practice is, is the meditation as well. energy and uh, part of the purpose of meditation is also to create the unity between the body and the mind to to realize that internally uh, we are vast uh, we are a universe inside with trillions of cells and trillions of enzymes and bacteria and a whole universe inside as, as well as outside I usually reach a certain peak moment where I feel completely one and uh, it's a very powerful moment uh, but uh, like all things uh, it changes, it transforms, it comes and it goes and, and then that tells me that it's over for that day. At that point I stop the sound. So we are just a little locus of energy in, in, in the universe, each one of us, and uh, that energy can be directed, uh, should be directed, and uh, uh, how to do that, if you learn to do it, you are learning how to live your life. That's part of my mindfulness training in, um, in uh, Zen, which is probably my major philosophical orientation in the end. Um, the uh, philosophical part of Zen is uh, that uh, you just fully conscious and aware in the moment. In the end, it was just a matter of uh, what do I know for sure, and, and, and it's um, five things. To be, that is, that I exist. That's irrefutable. You know, what I am at any one particular time, that's always changing. It's never one thing from one minute to the next, but at least I know that I exist in, in some way or other. Uh, the second thing is desire, uh, and the third is to conceive. So this is the, the, the biological bottom line that we are programmed mainly to survive uh, and, and to reproduce. And that life is an energy that, that is mainly programmed 
totally programmed to perpetuate itself uh, as our plants and, and all other organisms, living organisms. Uh, so then, uh, you know, starting around in our late 20s, we start to decay, uh, you know, the, the, the skin stops producing collagen at the right rate, so the skin starts to sag, and uh, 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 slowly but surely, uh, uh, the, the uh, um, cells do not reproduce at the same rate, and so on. So the decline starts then, uh, not long after the uh, age of conception, or when we See, so, um, and, and, and then finally we die. You know, and that is, so those are the five things that I know for sure. <laughs> now, the mystery is, so why do I make these things? You know, and, and that's the mystery of, of art. You know, I have no idea. You know, I just uh, feel compelled to make them. And when I make things, uh, uh, it focuses my mind. It, it's a way of meditation by just using my hands and, and materials and interacting. But after I've made something, then I, the only other mandate that an artist has is to show it, you know, to share it with someone else. Uh, maybe it can enrich their life in some way. Maybe it can help to focus their mind and maybe not. Uh, but, you know, when I have a show, I look at it, I suddenly realize this is where I was at this moment, this precise moment in time. I assembled these things that I made at disparate moments in my life, and this is what was in my mind. Uh, and uh, so I have suddenly brought into focus at one point in time my existence. You know, you can say, well, that's selfish. You know, I just, you just do it for yourself. Well, okay. You know, that's that's it. You know, and maybe somebody else will. You know, maybe I can share that. I, I talk. I, I do this video. I, and I hope that somebody else maybe gets something. I mean, I have drunk at the table and eaten at the table of many great artists, and, and uh, that's, they've helped to get me to here as well. So, uh, you know, I hate artist statements, uh, but I did bring one along. Uh, I hate artist statements because it, it, it gets into the weeds of a gobbledygook and blah, 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 and, and, and all of this. And it's gotten to the point where people are right artist statements, the art is all in the statement and, and not, nothing to, on the wall. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, I, I sometimes want to give people the keys to what I'm doing so they know what frame of mind I'm in when, they, when they're approaching it. People always ask me, say, your art is so spiritual, you know, and, and, and they, t they talk to me about the soul and, you know, what I believe about the afterlife and all that, and I have to tell them I don't believe in anything, I don't believe in anything. Uh, I'm not really spiritual. Uh, and so this is what I said in my keys statement. Some may claim that my work, uh, some may classify my work as spiritual, but I believe in nothing. What is this nothing that I believe in? In Zen Buddhism, believing in nothing is quite natural. If I am close to anything, any spiritual system, it is Zen. I just don't know. Consciousness is incapable of knowing itself. The way to live is to be. Like the Buddha said, it's, uh, uh, I'm just a finger pointing at the moon. I'm not the moon. Sie, 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 sie,
Thank you. 